Welcome to another Speak of the Devil Presents Satanic Essay Reading and Discussion. Today I'm being joined by the incomparable Satanist Cameron John. How you doing, man? Why, why would anybody want to compare me anyways? I'm pretty fucking lame. They could. But I'm doing, I am doing great today, Adam. How are you? <laughs> I'm good now. I'm good. I was a little blah earlier, but uh, now I'm good. We're going to be doing an essay out of, um, I don't even know if you could really call it an essay. It's more like uh, a couple of letters <laughs> or the journals uh, it's in a book of essays so it counts that's true okay so it's an essay <laughs> about new york uh it's called hell of a town and this is of course from the satanic scriptures by magus peter h gilmore Let's see that spine which copy are you holding what do you mean i, I was asked which spine yeah we got the oh. old school ones yeah it's <laughs> how we roll man fuck hey how we fucking roll oh scoot yeah, words. I don't know why I did that. Um, all right, so we're going to be uh, doing a, performing a live reading. Uh, Cameron, you're going to be performing the first half or the first essay or journal entry, and I'm going to do the second journal entry. I will do part one. Yeah, okay, that's actually better. <clears throat> and I'll do part two. And then on the other side of those parts, on the other side of our parts, we'll talk about our parts. <laughs> that each other, yeah. each other's parts. We'll talk about each other's parts. Usually it happens a little bit later in the conversation, but whatever. Or earlier, rather. Sorry. Earlier in the conversation yeah. that we discuss each other's it parts. It always comes up, though. We'll do it afterwards. It always. always every up. goddamn time. I'm really bright on my camera. I never adjusted my... Fucking, all right. I'm, I'm all well, nice and shiny and glistening. Yeah, I'm not could. sweating. I'm glistening. That's sexy. Yeah. That's it's sexy sweat sexy. is glistening. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Let's do this, man. On that note... <clears throat> The Great Dark of 2003. There was much poetry in the shadows last night. The mighty light bringer wrought by Edison and Tesla closed its eyes at 4.10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The people of New York were startled, but soon gained their bearings as traffic lights went out on the avenues, and those on the side streets insisted green for a while. As the radio broadcast confirmed the lack of power was not caused by terrorists and then began singing Blame Canada for the grid failure. <laughs> Fucking Canada. I love it so much. <laughs> People started to head towards their homes by bus, cab, or on foot. Stores did a brisk business selling food and drinks and batteries. There was some urgency as the sun drew closer, on, closer to the western horizon in flaming New Jersey with its crimson glory. Peggy and I went out amongst the shuffling throng and brought home some food. We enjoyed a pleasant repast and then took Contessa Bella Lugosi, our black chow pup, out for a stroll before dusk turned to full darkness. Our neighborhood streets were filled with people passing through. Many locals had set up grills on the sidewalks and the smell of cooking meat wafted through the air, accompanied by competing musics launched by battery-powered boomboxes. A guitarist was on the stoop of the building when Comedy Central producers, or, or where Comedy Central produces the daily show. Our culture has bred an unending thirst for entertainment. As the darkness enveloped Manhattan, flickering candlelight proliferated in windows. Near, or several nearby telecommunication structures had generators, so their windows streamed brightness and stood as beacons in the dim canyons through which people were still wending their way, <clears throat> some with flashlights in hand. There was an air of a street festival, yet it seemed the bravado was fending off the primal fear of dying light that most of the herds holds in their heart. It was, for we children of the night, a time of great beauty. Moonlight bathed the black concrete towers while random spelunkers made their way past their bases. <clears throat> Sorry, wicked cotton mouth, say. <laughs> uh, where was I? The pinprick glimmers of guttering candles died one by one as the night pressed for victory. Ursa Major was clear to the naked eye for the first time since 1977 above these now quieted main streets. While traffic lessened and the headlight beams grew scarce, we experienced what this vast urban sprawl had been like before the impact of the night <clears throat> had been fended off by or fended off via artificial luciferianism that was a time when anyone or her perhaps anything might be awaiting prey in the ink black inner oh my god i can't talk today apparently this is a perfect time doing essay reading with the atom <laughs> intercises of the sleeping city the spell of the classic monsters, both human and supernatural, could again be cast on those who now sweated and dreamed in their apartments. 
victim to Longberry terrors. It was heady and invigorating to we who internally embraced the ebon majesty. The great dark reached forth in conquest, and we patriots of its empire celebrated its homogeny. Hours later, as night was banished by a pearlescent dawn, the masses stirred and rose with the returning Aton. We wistfully observed the profound quiet that still reigned, as radio oracles predicted the soon slumbering giant would again send its pulse to animate the silent great machines. Bathing and breakfast in the gray light was a pleasure. Yet the modern world abruptly intruded as a refrigerator trembled to, into activity at precisely 745. And so the poetic caress of the age-old night has once again been banished from our metropolitan sprawl. But its magic, as always, beats in the hearts of Satanists, for we are kin and the living priesthood of its eternal mysteries. 15 August 38 on Ossetanus. Nice, nice. Yeah, I did it. <laughs> Atlas Babylon. Alas, I'm just as good as you. Oh man, fuck, I'm rubbing off again. This is horrible. <laughs> Alas, Babylon. Ever since my youth, I visited New York City and have always been impressed on a very deep level with how it encompasses the entire range of capabilities of the human animal. When I moved here to Hell's Kitchen 25 years ago, it was the fulfillment of a long ambition. As a Satanist, I savor the stratification of our kind. I enjoy the rich creations of rare individuals and am fascinated by the depths of depravity of others. I attempt to avoid the majority of people as they are generally mediocrites and not worth any time or attention. What was refreshing about the city at the time, as opposed to upstate New York from whence I came, was the lack of moderation, with little of the dull middle ground to muddy the stark black and white scenery. In my experience, it has always seemed to be the world city, the capital and pivotal exemplar of what it means to be homo urbanus. All extremes of human types can be found here. Submoron, genius, the sophisticates, the naive. Times Square used to be the most potent vistas for viewing this entire spectrum in one glance. If one stood on Broadway and 42nd Street, simply by looking around, you could see human passions embodied, base sexuality in the venues of all facets of pornography, the restless mind hungry for information, in the endless electronic crawl of headlines and in the publications cramming the newsstands. Our need for fantasy was served by the many theaters, showing every th level of filth being produced and a similar range of live performance from the splendid to the sordid. There were shops that sold exotic weaponry and tacky souvenirs. The cuisine ranged from street vendors of dubious cleanliness and their quintessentially American Howard Johnson's to the second floor exotica of the Chinese Republic, one of the oldest Chinese restaurants in Midtown. During its final years, a visit required one to elbow aside pimps and hookers to get through the street level door and then climb up through the dingy graffiti... graffiti <laughs> graffiti-covered stairwell to reach the red-lined lounge with its faded light-boxed photos of Chinese location. Times Square was such a heady place to visit, it functioned in the way symbols do, allowing so much information to be in conscious focus in one intuitive flash. Sadly, much of this is gone, replaced by invading franchised businesses catering to the bland needs of tasteless drones. Neither belong here. I mourn the homogenization of this area that has been in effect in recent years, as it has slapped a sanitized mask on the true face of our Babylon, inviting hordes of consumer zombies to wander the sidewalks in fulfillment of Romero's dawn vision. Each year, Coney Island, longtime avatar of dreams just beyond one's grasp, loses more of its resonance as the archaeological remnants of people's desperate search for diversion and fulfillment are swept clean. New York City has been attracting more of the marching morons of the herd, who now linger rather than passing through, and in that way, it becomes a more attractive reflection of our whole species, accurate reflection. I'm lately missing the purity of the old perspective. Our Hades on the Hudson seems to have had its sharp edges blunted, made child safe and tepid. But I take heart, as I know that no human ideal standeth sure, while the renovations and new construction currently shut aside the more Plutonian elements, 
They have not disappeared, been ameliorated or cured. Our town has always works to renew itself, but the squeaky clean results are short-lived. The hungry darkness still lurks on the fringes and will return to center stage in time, as the lodestone at these world crossroads is a powerful lure. Like the urban hellscapes in Blade Runner, the glittering techno-orgasmic displays create an even deeper shadows that will again be filled with those who will always call them home. Yes, our once and future Babylon is still satanic. And those of us who know it intimately can still find the stimulating extremes sidestepping the alien throng of mall cultists. Their, mom <clears throat> excuse me. Their moment is now, but I suspect that it shall be fleeting. The mask will slip, and when the true visage is glimpsed, it will send them scurrying back to the imagined normality of those prosaic suburbs and heartland states. The current forces of sterilization are different from their previous attempts to boulderize the city because of their premeditation and financial power, and it may be that the areas blighted by them may remain under their sway for some time. So long as there is a profitable market for Manhattan land experience amongst visitors who think the visiting safe simulcra is preferable to something more spicy, these spots will remain improved and resistant to the surroundings which haven't yet been redeemed. I cannot say for sure what may turn the tide, but in their greed, as soon as the income begins to decrease, the maintenance will lessen and things will become seedy and again, havens for what they view as the less savory. Unless the entire Isle of Manhattan is turned to the light side, it will remain adjacent crepuscular areas will be poised to ooze back when the opportunity presents itself. I'm not enough of a prophet to risk prediction of time frames. So many precious and bizarre things have vanished without proper replacements, such as Herman Slater's The Magical Child, which was a truly pluralistic palace of religious diversity. We need those fringe blocks when spaces, uh, with spaces when low enough rent to present opportunities for entrepreneurs of the bazaar. There was always enough business to support such niche providers. New York was the, the place that embraced the types who cherished the unorthodox, and I hope that these don't end up only as virtual emporiums in cyberspace. This city still interests me, and, <clears throat> excuse me, as there is enough remaining eccentricity with peculiar folk plying trades and manners long forgotten elsewhere. But you have to look harder for them these days. So long as they can afford to remain in business, and so long as kindred outsiders with unique visions and the drive to try and make it here brave the pilgrimage and put down roots, the heart of this dark carnival will continue to beat. 17 May, 40, Anno Satanus. All right, man. This is certainly an ode to New York. Uh, what? <laughs> I didn't realize that's what we're talking about. I love New uh, York. New York of a time gone. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I've I've always been. I've always tried to distance myself from romanticize uh, romanticizing locations, especially ones that are in in this particular case. He was born and raised in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. uh, which is just a train ride to, to New York City proper, where he, he's speaking to in, these, in this essay. Um, is it dangerous to yearn or, 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 or try to latch on to a, a, a former version of one's home? Or, or is it okay to just romanticize and remember? Hmm. I mean, I'm definitely one for romanticizing it. Like, it's... It, the thing is, as long as you can understand that that's not reality, like that is just, you know, a part of your mind and how you think of the place and you can remove yourself from that when you actually go there. Eh, I don't see it as a big deal. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's like I've never been to New York proper or anything like that. But when I think it, you know, I think of shit like you know, Toxic Avenger or Street Trash, like just that like real gritty, you know, it's going to smell like bum piss and somebody's mm -hmm. probably going to stab you. And it's just taxi beautiful. Driver. It's like so full of life. I yeah. mean, you know, I like my references better, but taxi drivers. <laughs> have really good um, yeah. So I can, I can definitely understand that, especially because it's uh, a place that has its own character. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's essentially forgetting the past. If you don't to an extent, like have a little bit of endearment to it. 
Well, it is weird because there's only a handful of cities that are like New York and mm-hmm. arguably none specifically like New York, but no. in their in their vast uh, devotion of its inhabitants, you have massive cities like Chicago, St. Louis, um, and nowadays Atlanta, you have uh, Boston. I mean, th- there are cities that are characters in and of mm-hmm. themselves that speak to the greater American experience and none, none even come close to a New York. And, and oh, yeah. you know, he's referencing how New York has been altered to this sort of Manhattan land um, mall culture. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to go back to my earlier reference. There was once a Scorsese land, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, where yeah. we get, we get pictures of the New York that was um, mm-hmm. this seedy underbelly where crime was incredibly common, just pervasive, and safety. I mean, you know, it was it, it was sort of the uh, the ever present beginning of every Batman film ever. You know? <laughs> yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just how New York is seen everywhere around the world, and New York is probably one of the only towns that lives up to its reputation. And nah, it's so gentrified now. I doubt it. I, I well, doubt it. Well, certainly in his memory in the in this essay. Yeah, I mean, um, this is also the love of it. Yeah. So I get it. I get it. And so my purpose of just waxing on like this is just to say, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to romanticize what once was when it was such a powerful character on the world <laughs> stage. Oh, yeah. And certainly if you have that intimate firsthand connection to it, I think there's something really wonderful about it. But Magus Gilmore does something in these in this essay. I keep trying to singularize it, but it's really just two. Um, that you don't often find, and that's not romanticizing on the past as it were uh, in infinitum. Like he is mm. referencing on how life is now, and in calling back to a. a a more desirable time for perhaps our kind or certainly the children of the night, uh, mm-hmm. which we often embody, um, if for no other reason in, in, in spirit and aesthetics. Rather than just latching onto that history, he's, he's recognizing where he is. He's not trying to pretend it's still the way it was, but he's also doing a little bit of proselytizing in the, the, the dream that mm-hmm. it may still return to whence it came from. And I think there's something kind of nice about that. It's, it's, oh, yeah. I understand that my city has been taken over, but I still, the, the denizens are still here. We've mm-hmm. just been pushed further into the crevices, but give us a chance. We'll come <laughs> back out. You know? Yeah, I, I can definitely appreciate that sentiment. I mean, I, I'm an Ogden kid. I mean, that's like the shithole of Utah. Like, that's, I mean, it was too fucking hard. <laughs> For Al Capone's, really you know, criminal ass to be here, and I mean, even is that just true? In, yeah, Al Capone is on record as saying that Ogden was too fucking hard for him. God like two bit was you, Tom, man. nothing to fuck about or fuck around with. <laughs> like even just, I'd say like maybe a decade ago, it was, you know, you'd still it was, it's a nice place to live. It smells like dog food, but you know, at least there's street tacos <laughs> to cover that. But, I mean, even just a decade ago, you still, like, the second the sun goes down, you're probably going to get shot at. And it's a lot safer now, but I still look back at that shit fondly, like, growing up there and just, yeah. you know, it makes you the person you are to be well, there, around that kind of shit. And there's, there's like, a pride that comes with being able to survive, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. To be able to, to live somewhere like, uh, in our case, in Ogden or, or in uh, Megas Gilmore's play, uh, case, uh, New York. Yeah, much that, harder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're not comparing the two directly. No, no, no. no. These are scalable <laughs> comparisons. Uh, but when you are from a seedy, underbelly type town, there's a pride in living there. It's like, no, I can survive this. I am of this place. It is a piece of me, and I am a piece of it. Like no. you, you, you embody it in in the way that you approach the rest of the world or surrounding towns, for sure. And I don't know, like there, there's with all of humanity, there's certainly a tribalism, um, no matter where you live in some uh, measure. But for those types of towns or those types of cities, it goes a little, it runs a little deeper, I think, when there's blood Definitely. invested in it, you know? Oh, yeah. So Definitely. 
Do you think, um, to some of his uh, prognosticating, that perhaps it will return to the seedy underbelly? Or do you think that Manhattanland has lasted so long that it just, it'll never go back? Uh, I don't know. That's hard to say. Like, it's it's really ultimately a cultural thing. Like, mm -hmm. it depends on what people allow. I mean, in our current state of affairs, like, I I doubt anytime soon because just everybody's just so soft and everything's so offensive that, I mean, you can't do, like, you can't get away with the kind of shit that, you know, you would imagine seeing like back in like the wonderful seventies films and eighties mm -hmm. films. Like anytime I think New York, aside from like, you know, upstate like Buffalo and shit, like I fucking love that place. Um, but like New York proper, you just, you always imagine you're going to get pissed on by somebody. <laughs> Maybe get stabbed with a needle or just get stabbed, stabbed. I don't see it getting to that point. Just a random needle. Soon. Yeah. Well, I mean, shit, that was a Hold thing this. back in the 80s, man. I was getting stuck with hypos and shit, like people trying to rob you that way. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, man. I would totally give my wallet over. <laughs> I'd just fucking kill myself. I got stuck with a hypo. I didn't give a shit. they pull that case off like it's brand new i'd probably still kill myself <laughs> not worth risking it i'm gonna have a disease <laughs> oh man um yeah and, and i i loved the first essay where he opened with the idea of the entire city just shutting down it's fucking beautiful. and people who normally dwell inside and i think it would be it would be more of the case nowadays than even when he wrote it um because i do think we have turned more into internal you know home structural creatures rather mm. than adventuresome get outside and i don't know maybe it's different in the city because you don't have all of the comforts of home in a home because you're living in a shitty one bedroom apartment so maybe yeah. the communal experience is certainly different in those environments but i can't help but think that it it would very much the power goes out people are going to the streets and they're going to just sort of have a community experience yeah i couldn't see that changing yeah I, mean, I like that. that maybe not the one. boom boxes. It'll be like some little Beats pill or some shit. <laughs> yeah, until close. the battery runs out of their fucking phone. Like, yeah. That's just how it works now. <laughs> <laughs> I do love that 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 phrase, that term, dates Megas Gilmore so hard. I don't know if anyone nowadays knows what a fucking boom box is. Yeah. Like, I, mean, I, really? I can't talk shit because I got a fucking Walkman like right here by my oh, monitor. Yes. So. Yeah, see, so yeah, I, uh, awesome, then. I I still hold on to that shit. Still works. <laughs> Got the Hobbit in there because. Oh actually, wow! Oh yeah. The audiobook I, of the Hobbit. I, yeah, that's a full production because wow. I'm not cool. I'm not that, that is cool. pretty cool. Man. <laughs> I mean, for those of us who enjoy a little Tolkien, but yeah, that's awesome. I rem I don't want to sidetrack too much. I remember what, but I do want to talk about the Hobbit now that you mentioned it. Mm -hmm. I remember watching the cartoon and just loving the art um, style the like everything about that was so great the music the poetry the story so good i love the hobbit yeah i wasn't a fan <laughs> oh you didn't like the cartoon no no well so we read the book I'm in totally elementary deviating now. <laughs> like that was one of the courses or one of the parts of the course and then as a treat once we finished it we watched the cartoon and it just fell so fucking flat for me as far as like, you know, reading this beautiful novel and then getting yeah. that. It had to be scaled down for yeah. sure. I, I mean, mean, I can appreciate it, but yeah, it wasn't, uh, I, I'd bummer. still rather reach for the book or the movies. See, I did the opposite. It was the cartoon first and then the book. Ah, so so I, maybe I, that's I why that then. I, I have a little that. bit in the same way that Megas, I'm going to try to pull it back here. In the same way that Megas <laughs> Gilmore romanticized, uh, his town, his city, I romanticized the cartoon. That's fair. I <laughs> if I watched it nowadays, I'd probably <laughs> puke, but <laughs> I really did like the art at the time. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about these ideas of, of, of finding a connection within our, the, the, the locations that we love so, so desperately, because I do kind of feel like that's the undertone of all of this. It's just, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's like uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, no, no, no. Henry David Thoreau. This is uh, Megas Gilmore's Walden Pond, New York. Mm -hmm. You know, this is just sort of the place where he feels alive and connected. And it certainly connects with the satanic underbelly that he carries with him. You know, it, it stokes that black flame. Um, as far as locations, is that Ogden for you? 
Oh yeah, definitely. Like that's, that's my home. Like nothing walk, nothing like walking up and down two bit or sorry, 25th street. So everybody knows, like, it's Outsiders, just, we don't know. Anytime I feel, anytime I'm walking there, especially at night, it just, even though I know that nothing's ever going to happen, it still feels dangerous to me. It still feels beautiful. Like you get all the classic neon lights that have been restored um, to a lot of the old buildings. And it just, yeah. it feels like it takes you back to a different place and it's just, it's like the the gathered energy of the place. It never quite dissipates. It's just people aren't attuned to it. Yeah. Um, and that's that's definitely one thing I do take away from the the essay is someone being able to appreciate the collective energy of you know the place they reside. Like yeah. not everybody can appreciate that. I was listening to or I was watching um, the latest season. Uh, this is going to sound strange, but I'm going to bring it back. The latest season of Jerry Seinfeld's Comedian in Cars Getting Coffee. And he's speaking with one of uh, the comedians and talking about uh, a sort of tuning fork tone um, mm -hmm. that every place you live has this frequency that it vibrates at. And if you vibrate with that same frequency, you feel connected to it and you feel at home. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, then, of course, you're completely you know, rejected by it or uh, you know, just dismiss it and just don't like it at all. And I like that idea that, you know, in the same way that Magus Gilmore references uh, Satanism as this sort of meta tribe, and it has this sort of orchestral resonance with us as Satanists, the, the religion itself, mm -hmm. we do have these sort of tonal frequencies that, that match up with each other or with uh, the religion and with the locations in which we live and we have these fond memories of. Mm -hmm. And these notes act in harmony to create the greater version of what you are uh, as an individual and certainly how you operate in these locations in which you resonate. I like that idea a lot. Oh, yeah. And so for you, it's Ogden. For him, uh, it's New York. I think for me, it's got to be something a little bit like Salem, Utah, which is this tiny, tiny, tiny little Mormon town that is very rural, um, middle of nowhere. But I I grew up in the 80s in that town in the midst of the satanic panic. And we had mm -hmm. these woods at the end of my street, <laughs> which were devil worshiping woods that we would go play in. And there did was you worship the devil out there, Adam? <laughs> I still worship the devil. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> I used to go there just to be in that resonant frequency. Like, mm -hmm. I love the terror of going into unknown woods, especially woods with myth surrounding them. And even though the reality is far from it, I still appreciated that the terror in the tales that were passed down throughout this small little rural community. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll always connect with, you know, the sort of Puritan tales uh, brought to life in book or movie form because I connect with that small town vibe isolated from the greater world and the terrors of what it, what is lurking outside mm -hmm. its boundaries you know I just love yeah. that so much so those are my types of locations that I uh, connect with I don't know I think we, maybe we've uh, exhausted our, our discussion of this is there anything else you wanted to touch on no I, th I think we uh think we covered everything i'm just going to continue like waxing ogden and yeah. you know telling people they can <laughs> fuck themselves if they don't like ogden but that, that will do us no good hey if capone <laughs> couldn't handle but you could i'd say it's a pretty good guy in place uh, fucking a. yeah all right everyone read the essay yourself um i, I feel look. like i'm gonna say something really quick just yeah. a, a little sidebar i feel like i really screwed the fucking pooch like i have the i have this book like the Spanish format of it. And oh, I really should have just fucked with you and actually read the first part in that. And I just realized uh, I'm, I'm sorry, everybody that's going to watch this later on. Yeah. Just, uh, could have been brilliant. We're it could have been have hilarious. To... My horrible Utah accent with Spanish. Uh, so that sorry. Pretty awesome. Uh, well, read it in Espanol or English uh, on your own terms. Uh, it is the satanic scriptures essays, hell of a town. And it's by Megas P. Rage Gilmore. Thank you guys so much for your patronage. Thank you for your support of this show. And I hope that these little uh, essay readings and discussions uh, embody that idea of study, not worship that is inherent within the religion of Satanism. Cameron, thanks so much for joining me on this. Glad I could finally be back on. Yeah, I love it, man. Anytime we can chat, I love it. Uh, yeah, all right, everyone, we're going to go do a Star Wars show. So until we can speak of the devil again, may the force be with you. <laughs> Hail Vader.
<laughs> I'm glad. Damn it. You good. just stole my shit. I was gonna fuck. With it. I was gonna do it. <laughs> Don't. <laughs>